Hello everyone, and welcome once again to Soft Stories. I'm Stratton, and today we are continuing our reading of Robert Louis Stevenson's delightful children's book, Treasure Island. We are now on page 215 of this particular copy of Treasure Island, which is well more than two-thirds of the way through. It's quite exciting that we are reaching the climax of this book, and that soon we will be at its end and on to whatever the next adventure is that's in store for us. I've got a couple of ideas that I'm looking forward to, so I hope you'll stay with me for those after we finish Treasure Island. Now, for the moment, let us content ourselves with the adventures of young Jim Hawkins, with Chapter 27 Pieces of Eight Owing to the cant of the vessel, the masts hung far out over the water, and from my perch on the cross trees, I had nothing below me but the surface of the bay. Hands who was not so far up, was, in consequence, nearer to the ship, and fell between me and the bulwarks. He rose once to the surface in a lather of foam and blood, and then sank again for good. As the water settled, I could see him lying huddled together on the clean, bright sand in the shadow of the vessel's side. A fish or two whipped past his body. Sometimes, by the quivering of the water, he appeared to move a little, as if he were trying to rise. But he was dead enough for all that, both being shot and drowned, and was food for fish, in the very place where he had designed my slaughter. I was no sooner certain of this than I began to feel sick, faint, and terrified. The hot blood was running over my back and chest. The dirk where it had pinned my shoulder to the mast, seemed to burn like a hot iron. Yet it was not so much these real sufferings that distressed me, for these, it seemed to me, I could bear without a murmur. It was the horror I had upon my mind of falling from the cross-trees. into that still green water beside the body of the coxswain. I clung with both hands till my nails ached and I shut my eyes as if to cover up the peril. Gradually my mind came back again, my pulses quieted down to a more natural time and I was once more in possession of myself. It was my first thought to pluck forth the dirk, but either it stuck too hard or my nerve failed me, and I desisted with a violent shudder. Oddly enough, that shudder did the business. The knife, in fact, 
had come the nearest in the world to missing me altogether. It held me by a mere pinch of skin, and this the shudder tore away. The blood ran down the faster, to be sure, but I was my own master again, and only tacked to the mast by my coat and shirt. These last I broke through with a sudden jerk, and then regained the deck by the starboard shrouds, for nothing in the world would I have again ventured, shaken as I was, upon the overhanging port shrouds from which Israel had so lately fallen. I went below and did what I could for my wound. It pained me a good deal and still bled freely, but it was neither deep nor dangerous, nor did it greatly call me when I used my arm. Then I looked around me, and the ship, as it was now, in a sense, my own, I began to think of clearing it from its last passenger, the dead man, O'Brien. He had pitched, as I have said, against the bulwarks, where he lay like some horrible, ungainly sort of puppet. Life-size, indeed, but how different from life's colour or life's comeliness. In that position I could easily have my way with him, and as the habit of tragical adventures had worn off almost all my terror for the dead, I took him by the waist, as if he had been a sack of bran, and with one good heave tumbled him overboard. He went in with a sounding plunge. The red cap came off and remained floating on the surface, and as soon as the splash subsided, I could see him and Israel Hands lying side by side, both wavering with the tremulous movement of the water. O'Brien though still quite a young man, was very bald. There he lay with that bald head across the knees of the man who had killed him, and the quick fishes steering to and fro over both. I was now alone upon the ship. The tide had just turned. The sun was within so few degrees of setting that already the shadow of the pines upon the western shore began to reach right across the anchorage and fall in patterns on the deck. The evening breeze had sprung up, and though it was well warded off by the hill with the two peaks upon the east, the cordage had begun to sing a little softly to itself and the idle sails to rattle to and fro. I began to see a danger to the ship. The jibs I speedily doused and brought tumbling to the deck, but the mainsail was a harder matter. Of course, when the schooner cantered over, the boom had swung outward, and the cap of it and a foot or two of sail hung even under water. I thought this made it still more dangerous. Yet the strain was so heavy that I half feared to meddle. At last I got my knife and cut the halyards. The peak dropped instantly. A great belly of loose canvas floated broad upon the water. And, since, pull as I liked, I could not budge the downhaul. That was the extent of what I could accomplish. For the rest, 
the Hispaniola must trust to luck, like myself. By this time, the whole anchorage had fallen into shadow. The last rays I remember falling through a glade of the wood and shining bright as jewels on the flowery mantle of the wreck. It began to be chill. The tide was rapidly fleeting seawards, the schooner settling more and more on her beam end. I scrambled forward and looked over. It seemed shallow enough, and holding the cut horser in both hands for a last security, I let myself drop softly overboard. The water scarcely reached my waist. The sand was firm and covered with ripple marks, and I waded ashore in great spirits, leaving the Hispaniola on her side with her mainsail trailing wide upon the surface of the bay. About the same time the sun went fairly down, and the breeze whistled low in the dusk among the tossing pines. At least, and at last, I was off the sea, nor had I returned thence empty-handed, there lay the schooner, clear at last from buccaneers, and ready for our own men to board and get to sea again. I had nothing nearer my fancy than to get home to the stockade and boast of my achievements. Possibly I might be blamed a bit for my truantry, but the recapture of the Hispaniola was a clenching answer and I hoped that even Captain Smollett would confess I had not lost my time. So thinking, and in famous spirits, I began to set my face homeward for the blockhouse and my companions. I remembered that the most easterly of the rivers which drain into Captain Kidd's anchorage ran from the two-peaked hill upon my left, and I bent my course in that direction, that I might pass the stream while it was small. The wood was pretty open, and keeping along the lower spurs, I had soon turned the corner of that hill, and not long after waded to the mid-calf across the watercourse. This brought me near to where I had encountered Ben Gunn, the maroon, and I walked more circumspectly, keeping an eye on every side. The dusk had come nigh hand completely, and as I opened out the cleft between the two peaks, I became aware of a wavering glow against the sky, where, as I judged, the man of the island was cooking his supper before a roaring fire. And yet I wondered, in my heart, that he should show himself so careless. For if I could see this radiance, might it not reach the eyes of Silver himself, where he camped upon the shore among the marshes? Gradually the night fell blacker. It was all I could do to guide myself, even roughly, towards my destination. The double hill behind me and the spyglass on my right loomed faint and fainter. The stars were few and pale, and in the low ground where I wandered I kept tripping among bushes and rolling into sandy pits. Suddenly a kind of brightness fell about me. I looked up. A pale glimmer of moonbeams had alighted on the summit of the spyglass. And soon after I saw something, broad and silvery, moving low down behind the trees, and I knew the moon had risen.
with this to help me, I passed rapidly over what remained to me of my journey, and, sometimes walking, sometimes running, impatiently drew near to the stockade. Yet as I began to thread the grove that lies before it, I was not so thoughtless but that I slacked my pace and went a trifle warily. It would have been a poor end to my adventures to get shot down by my own party in mistake. The moon was climbing higher and higher. Its light began to fall here and there, in masses through the more open districts of the wood. And right in front of me, a glow of a different colour appeared among the trees. It was red and hot, and now again it was a little darkened, as if it were the embers of a bonfire smouldering. For the life of me, I could not think what it might be. At last, I came right down upon the borders of the clearing. The western end was already steeped in moonshine. The rest, and the blockhouse itself, still lay in a black shadow, chequered with long, silvery streaks of light. On the other side of the house, an immense fire had burned itself into clear embers and shed a steady, red reverberation, contrasted strongly with the mellow paleness of the moon. There was not a sound stirring, nor a soul beside the noises of the breeze. I stopped, with much wonder in my heart, but perhaps a little terror also. It had not been our way to build great fires. We were, indeed, by the captain's orders, somewhat niggardly on firewood, and I began to fear that something had gone wrong while I was absent. I stole round by the eastern end, keeping close in shadow, and, at a convenient place where the darkness was thickest, cross the palisade. To make assurance surer, I got upon my hands and knees and crawled, without a sound, towards the corner of the house. As I drew nearer, my heart was suddenly and greatly lightened. It is not a pleasant noise in itself, and I have often complained of it at other times, but just then it was like music to hear my friends snoring together so loud and peaceful in their sleep. Mm. The sea cry of the watch, that beautiful all's well, never fell more reassuringly on my ear. In the meantime, there was no doubt of one thing. They kept an infamously bad watch. If it had been Silver and his lads that were now creeping in on them, not a soul would have seen daybreak. That was what it was, thought I, to have the captain wounded, and again I blamed myself sharply for leaving them in that danger, with so few to mount a guard. By this time I had got to the door and stood up. All was dark within, so that I could distinguish nothing by the eye. As for sounds, there was the steady drone of the snorers, and a small occasional noise, a flickering or pecking that I could in no way account for. With my arms before me, I walked steadily in. I should lie down in my own place, I thought, with a silent chuckle, and enjoy their faces when they found me in the morning. My foot struck something yielding. It was a sleeper's leg, and he turned and groaned, but without waking. And then, 
all of a sudden, a shrill voice broke forth out of the darkness. Pieces of right, pieces of right, pieces of right, pieces of right, and so forth, without pause or change, like the clacking of a tiny mill. <laughs> Silver's green parrot, Captain Flint. It was she whom I had heard pecking at a piece of bark. It was she keeping better watch than any human being, who thus announced my arrival with her wearisome refrain. I had no time left me to recover. At the sharp, clipping tone of the parrot, the sleepers awoke and sprang up, and with a mighty oath the voice of Silver cried, Who goes? I turned to run, struck violently against one person, recoiled, and ran full into the arms of a second, who for his part closed upon and held me tight. Bring a torch, Deck, said Silver, when my capture was thus assured. And one of the men left the log house, and presently returned with a lighted brand. Oh dear, I'm sure that's not exactly the welcome that Jim was expecting. Let's see how this goes, shall we? Part 6 Captain Silver Chapter 28 In the Enemy's Camp The red glare of the torch, lighting up the interior of the blockhouse, showed me the worst of my apprehensions realised. The pirates were in possession of the house and stores. There was the cask of cognac. There were the pork and bread, as before. And what tenfold increased my horror? Not a sign of any prisoner. I could only judge that all had perished, and my heart smote me sorely that I had not been there to perish with them. There were six of the buccaneers, all told. Not another man was left alive. Five of them were on their feet, flushed and swollen, suddenly called out of the first sleep of drunkenness. The sixth had only risen upon his elbow. He was a deathly pale, and the blood-stained bandage round his head told that he had recently been wounded, and still more recently dressed. I remembered the man who had been shot and had run back among the woods in the great attack and doubted not that this was he. The parrot sat, preening her plumage on Long John's shoulder. He himself, I thought, looked somewhat paler and more stern than I was used to. He still wore the fine broadcloth suit in which he had fulfilled his mission, but it was bitterly the worse for wear, daubed with clay and torn with the sharp briars of the wood. So, said he, here's Jim Morgan, shiver my timbers, dropped in like, eh? Well, come, I take that friendly and thereupon he sat down across the brandy cask, and began to fill a pipe. "'Give me a loan of the link, Dick,' said he, and then, when he had a good light, "'That'll do, lad,' he added. "'Stick the glim in the wood heap, and you, gentlemen, bring yourselves too. "'You needn't stand up for Mr. Hawkins. "'He'll excuse me. You, you may lay to that. "'And so, Jim.' stopping the tobacco. Here you were, and quite a pleasant surprise for poor old John. I see you were smart when I first set my eyes on you. But this here it gets away from me clean and do. To all this, as well may be supposed, I made no answer. They had set me with my back against the wall, and I stood there, looking silver in the face. Pluckily enough, I hope, to all outward appearance, but with black despair in my heart. 
Silver took a whiff or two of his pipe with great composure, and then ran on again. Now you see, Jim, so be as you are here, says he. I'll give you a piece of my mind. I've always liked you, I have, for a lad of spirit, and the picture of my own self when I was young and handsome. I always wanted you to join and take your share and die a gentleman. And now, my cock, you've got to. Captain Smollett's a fine seaman, as I'll own up to any day, but stiff on discipline. Duty is duty, says he, and right he is. Just you keep clear of the captain. The doctor himself has gone dead again, you. Ungrateful scamp, was what he said. And the short and the long of the whole story is about here. You can't go back to your own lot, for they won't have you. And, without you start a third ship's company all by yourself, which might be lonely, you'll have to join up with Captain Silver. So far, so good. My friends, then, were still alive. And though I partly believed the truth of Silver's statement, that the cabin party were incensed at me for my desertion, I was more b relieved than distressed by what I heard. I don't say nothing as to your being in our hands, continued Silver, though there you are, and you may lay to it. I'm all for argument. I've never seen good come out of threatening. If you like the service, well, you'll join. And if you don't, Jim, why, you're free to answer no. Free and welcome, shipmate. And if fairer can be said by mortal seamen, shiver my sides. Am I to answer, then? I asked, with a very tremulous voice. Through all this sneering talk, I was made to feel the threat of death that overhung me, and my cheeks burned, and my heart beat painfully in my breast. Lad, said Silver, no one's a pressing of you. Take your bearings. None of us won't hurry you, mate. Time goes so pleasant in your company, you see. Well, says I, growing a little bolder, if I'm to choose... I declare I have a right to know what's what, and why you're here, and where my friends are. What's what? repeated one of the buccaneers in a deep growl. Uh, he'd be a lucky one as know that. You'll perhaps button down your hatches till you're spoken to, my friend, cried Silver trunkatently to the speaker. And then, in his first gracious tones, he replied to me. Yesterday morning, Mr. Hawkins, said he, in the dog watch, down came Dr. Livesey with a flag of truce. Says he, Captain Silver, you're sold out. Ship's gone. Well, maybe we've been taking a glass and a song to help it round. I won't say no. Leastways, one of us had looked out. We looked out by thunder, and the old ship was gone. I never seen a pack of fools look fishier, and you might lay to that if I tells you that looked the fishiest. Well, says the doctor, let's bargain. We bargained, him and I, and here we are. Stores, brandy, blockhouse, the firewood you was thoughtful enough to cut. And, in a manner of speaking... The whole blessed boat from cross trees to Keelson. As for them, they've tramped. Don't know where they's gone. He drew again, quietly, at his pipe. Unless you should take it into your head that that head of yours, he went on, that you was included in the treaty. Here's the last word that was said. How many are you, says I, to leave. Four, says he, four and one of us wounded. As for that boy, I don't know where he is, confound him, says he. 
nor I don't much care. We're about sick of him. These was his words. Is that all? I asked. Well, it's all that you've to hear, my son, returned Silver. And now am I to choose? And now you are to choose, and you may lay at that, said Silver. Well, said I, I am not such a fool, but I know pretty well what I have to look for. Let the worst come to the worst. It's little I care. I've seen too many die since I fell in with you, but there's a thing or two I have to tell you, I said, and by this time I was quite excited. And the first is, here you are in a bad way. Ship lost, treasure lost, men lost, your whole business gone to wreck. And if you want to know who did it, it was I. I was in the apple barrel the night we sighted land, and I heard you, John, and you, Dick Johnson, and Hans, who is now at the bottom of the sea, and I told every word you said before the hour was out. And as for the schooner, it was I who cut her cable, and it was I that killed the men you had aboard of her, and it was I who brought her where you'll never see her more, not one of you. The laugh's on my side. I've had the top of this business. From the first. I no more fear you than I fear a fly. Kill me, if you please, or spare me. But one thing I'll say, and no more. If you spare me, bygones are bygones, and when you fellows are in court for piracy, I'll save you all I can. It is for you to choose. Kill another, and do yourselves no good, or spare me, and keep a witness to save you from the gallows. I stopped, for, I tell you, I was out of breath, and to my wonder, not a man of them moved, but all sat, staring at me, like as many sheep. And while they were still staring, I broke out again. And now, Mr. Silver, I believe you're the best man here, and if things go the worst, I'll take it kind of you to let the doctor know the way I took it. I'll bear it in mind, said Silver, with an accent so curious that I could not, for the life of me, decide whether he were laughing at my request, or had been favourably affected by my courage. I'll but wonder that, cried the old mahogany-faced seaman, Morgan by name, who I had seen in Long John's public house, upon the quays of Bristol. It was him that knowed Black Dog. Well, and see here, added the sea cook, I'll put her another again to that by thunder, for it was this same boy that faked the chart from Billy Bones. First and last we've split upon Jim Hawkins. Then he goes, said Morgan with an oath, and he sprang up, drawing his knife as if he had been twenty. Avast there! cried Silver. Who are you, Tom Morgan? Maybe you thought you was captain here, perhaps. By the powers, I'll teach you better. Cross me and you'll go where a many a good man's gone before you, first and last these thirty year back. Some to the yard arm shiver my sides, and some by the board to feed the fishes. There's never a man looked me between the eyes and seen a good day outwards. Tom Morgan, you may lay to that. Morgan paused, but a hoarse murmur rose from the others. Tom's right, said one. I stood hazing long enough from one, added another. I'll be hanged if I be hazed by you, John Silver. Did any of you gentlemen want to have it out with me? Roared Silver, bending forward from his position on the keg, with his pipe still glowing in his right hand. Put a name on what you're at. You ain't dumb, I reckon. Him that wants shall get it. 
how I lived this many years and a son of a rum punchin cock is had athwart at my house at the latter end of it. You know the way, you're all gentlemen of fortune, by your account. Well, I'm ready. Take a cutlass, him that dares, and I'll see the colour of his inside, crutch and all, before that pipe's empty. Not a man stirred. Not a man answered. That's your sort, is it? He added, returning his pipe to his mouth. Well, you're a gay lot to look at, anyway. Not much worth to fight, you ain't. Perhaps you can understand King George's English. I'm come here by election. I'm come here because I'm the best man by a long sea mile. You won't fight, as gentlemen of fortune should. Then by thunder you'll obey. And you may lay to it. I like that boy now. I never seen a boy better than that. He's more a man than any pair of rats of you in this here house. And what I say is this. Let me see him that'll lay a hand on him. That's what I say. And you may lay to it. There was a long pause after this. I stood straight up against the wall, my heart still going like a sledgehammer, but with a ray of hope now shining in my bosom. Silver leant back against the wall, his arms crossed, his pipe in the corner of his mouth, as calm as though he had been at church. Yet his eye kept wandering furtively, and he kept the tale of it on his unruly followers. They, on their part, drew gradually together towards the far end of the blockhouse, and the low hiss of their whispering sounded in my ear continuously like a stream. One after another, they would look up, and the red light of the torch would fall for a second on their nervous faces. But it was not towards me, it was towards Silver that they turned their eyes. You seem to have a lot to say, remarked Silver, spitting far into the air. Pipe up and let me hear it, or lay to. Ax your pardon, sir returned one of the men. You're pretty free with some of the rules. Maybe you'll kindly keep an eye upon the rest. This crew's dissatisfied. This crew don't valley bullet in a marlin's bike. This crew has its rights, like other crews. I'll make so free as that. And by your own rules, I take it we can talk together. I ask your pardon, sir, acknowledging you to be the captain at this present. But I claim my right and steps outside for a council. And, with an elaborate sea salute, this fellow, a long, ill-looking man, yellow-eyed of five and thirty, stepped coolly toward the door and disappeared out of the house. One after another, the rest followed his example, each making a salute as he passed, each adding some apology. "'According to rules,' said one. "'Folks of counsel,' said Morgan. And so, with one remark or another, all marched out, and left Silver and me alone with the torch. The sea cook instantly removed his pipe. "'No, you look here, Jim Hawkins,' he said in a steady whisper. That was no more than audible. You were within half a plank of death. That's a long sight worse of torture. They're going to throw me off. But you mark. I stand by you through thick and thin. I didn't mean to. No, not till you spoke up. I was about desperate to lose that much blunt and be hanged into the bargain. But I see you was the right sort. I says to myself... You stand by Hawkins, John, and Hawkins will stand by you. 
Your last card and by the living thunder, John, he's yours. Back to back, says I. You'll save your witness and he'll save your neck. I began dimly to understand. You mean all's lost? I asked. I, by gum, I do, he answered. Ship gone, neck gone, that's the size of it. Once I looked into that bay, Jim Hawkins, and seen no schooner, well, I'm tough, but I gave out. As for that lot and their counsel, mark me, they're outright fools and cowards. I'll save your life, if so be as I can, from them. But see here, Jim, tit for tat. You save Long John from swinging. I was bewildered. It seemed a thing so hopeless he was asking. He, the old buccaneer, the ringleader throughout. What I can do, that I'll do, I said. It's a bargain, cried Long John. You speak up plucky and by thunder I'll have a chance. He hobbled to the porch, where it stood and propped among the firewood, and took a fresh light to his pipe. Understand me, Jim, he said, returning. I've a head on my shoulders, I have. I'm on Squire's side now. I know you've got that ship safe somewhere as how you done it? I don't know. But safe it is. I guess Hans and O'Brien turned soft. I never much believed in neither of them. No, you mark me. I ask no questions, nor I won't let others. I know when a game's up, I do, and I know a lad that's staunch. Ah, you that's young. You and me might have done a power of good together. He drew some cognac from the cask into a tin cannikin. Will you taste, messmate? he asked, and when I had refused, well, I'll take a drain myself, Jim, said he. I need a corker, for there's trouble on hand. And talking of trouble, why did that doctor give me the chart, Jim? My face expressed a wonder so unaffected that he saw the needlessness of further questions. Ah, well, he did, though, said he, and there's something under that, no doubt. Something, surely, under that, Jim. Bad or good? And he took another swallow of the brandy, shaking his great fair head like a man who looks forward to the worst. Chapter 29 The Black Spot Again The council of the buccaneers had lasted some time. Then one of them re-entered the house, and with a repetition of the same salute, which had, in my eyes, an ironical air, begged for a moment's loan of the torch. Silver briefly agreed and this emissary retired again, leaving us together in the dark. There's a breeze coming, Jim, said Silver, who had, by this time, adopted quite a friendly and familiar tone. I turned to the loophole nearest me and looked out. The embers of the great fire had so far burned themselves out, and now glowed so low and duskily, that I understood why these conspirators desired a torch. About halfway down the slope to the stockade, they were collected in a group. One held the light, another was on his knees in their midst, and I saw the blade of an open knife shine in his hand with varying colours in the moon and torchlight. 
The rest were all somewhat stooping, as though watching the manoeuvres of this last. I could just make out that he had a book as well as a knife in his hand, and was still wondering how anything so incongruous had come in their possession when the kneeling figure rose once more to his feet, and the whole party began to move together towards the house. Here they come, said I, and returned to my former position, for it seems beneath my dignity that they should find me watching them. Well, let them come, lad, let them come, said Silver, cheerily. I've still a shot in my locker. The door opened, and the five men, standing huddled together just inside, pushed one of their number forward. In any other circumstances, it would have been comical to see this slow advance, hesitating as he set down each foot, but holding his closed right hand in front of him. "'Step up, lad!' cried Silver. "'I won't eat you. Hand it over, lover. I know the rules, I do. I won't hurt a deputation.' Thus encouraged, the buccaneer stepped forth more briskly, and having passed something to silver, from hand to hand, slipped yet more smartly back again to his companions. The sea cook looked at what had been given him. The black spot. I thought so, he observed. Where might you have got the paper? Why? Hello. Look here now. This ain't lucky. You've gone and cut this out of a Bible. What fools cut a Bible? Ah, there, there, said Morgan. What did I say? No good will come of that, I said. Well, you've about fixed it now among you, continued Silver. You'll all swing now, I reckon. What soft-headed lubber had a Bible? It was Dick, said one. Dick, was it? Then Dick can get to prayers, said Silver. He's seen his slice of luck as Dick, and you may lay to that. But here the long man with the yellow eyes struck in. Bully that talk, John Silver, he said. This crew has tipped you the black spot in full council, as in duty bound. Just you turn it over, as in duty bound, and see what's wrote there. Then you can talk. Thank ye, George, replied the sea cook. You always was brisk for business, and has the rules by heart, George, as I'm pleased to see. Well, what is it, anyway? Ah, deposed. That's it, is it? Very pretty rote, to be sure. Like print, I swear. Did your hand a right, George? Why, you was getting quite a leading man in this here crew. You'll be captain next, I shouldn't wonder. Just oblige me with that torch again, will you? This pipe won't draw. Come now, said George. You don't fool this crew no more. You're a funny man by your own account. But you're over now. And you'll maybe step down off that barrel and help vote. I thought you said you know the rules, returned Silver contemptuously. Leastways, if you don't, I do. And I wait here, and I'm still your captain, mind, till you outs with your grievances. And I reply, in the meantime, your black spot ain't worth a biscuit. After that, we'll see. Ah, replied George. You don't be under no kind of apprehension. We're all square, we are. First, you've been hashed at this cruise. You'll be a bold man to say no to that. Second, you led the enemy out of this here trap for nothing. Why do they want out? I don't know, but it's pretty plain they wanted it. Third, 
You wouldn't let us go ahead of them all up on the march. Ah, uh, we see through you, John Silver. You want to play booty. That's what's wrong with you. And then, fourth, is this here boy. Is that all? Asked Silver quietly. Enough, too, retorted George. We'll all swing and sun dry for your bungling. Well, now, look here. I'll answer these four points. One after another, I'll answer them. I made a hash of this cruise, did I? Well, now, you all know what I wanted. And you all know, if that had been done, that we'd have been aboard the Hispaniola this night as ever was. Every man of us alive and fit, and full of good plum duff, and the treasure in the hold of her by thunder. Well, who crossed me? Who forced my hand as was the lawful captain? Who tipped me the black spot the day we landed and began this dance? Ah, it's a fine dance, I'm with you there. And looks mighty like a hornpipe in a rope send at execution dock by London town it does. But who done it? Why, it was Anderson and Hans. And you, George Murray. And you're the last above board of that same meddling crew. And you have the Davy Jones's insolence to up and stand for a captain over me. You that sank the lot of us. By the powers, by this tops the stiffest yarn to nothing. Silver paused, and I could see by the faces of George and his late comrades that these words had not been said in vain. That's for number one, cried the accused wiping the sweat from his brow, for he had been talking with a vehemence that shook the house. Why, I give you my word, I'm sick to speak to you. You've neither sense nor memory, and I'll leave it to fancy where your mother's was that let you come to see. See, gentlemen of fortune, I reckon traitors is your trade. Go on, John, said Morgan. Speak up to the others. Ah, the others. They're a nice lot, ain't I? You say this cruise is bungled. <laughs> Bite gum, if you could understand how bad it's bungled, you would see. We're that near the gibber that my neck's stiff thinking of it. You've seen him, maybe. Hanged in chains. Birds about him. Seamen pointing them out as they go down with the tide. Who's that? says one. That? Oh, why, that's John Silver. I knowed him well, says another. And you can hear the chains a jangle as you go about and reach for the other boy. Now that's about where we are. Every mother's son of us. Thanks to him and Hans. And Anderson and other ruination fools of you. And if you want to know about number four and that boy, why, shiver my timbers. Isn't he a hostage? Are we going to waste a hostage? No, not us. He might be our last chance. I shouldn't wonder. Kill that boy? Not me, mates. And number three? Ah, well... There's a deal to say to number three. Maybe you don't count it nothing to have a real college doctor come to see you every day. You, John, with your head broke. Or you, George Mary, that had the egg shakes upon you not six hours agone. And has your eyes the colour of lemon peel to the same moment on the clock. And maybe, perhaps, you didn't know there was a consort coming either. But there is. And not so long till then. And we'll see who will glad to have a hostage when it comes to that. And as for number two, why I made a bargain. Well, you came crawling on your knees to me to make it. 
on your knees to came you was that downhearted. And you'd have starved too if I hadn't. But that's a trifle. And look there. That's why. And he cast down upon the floor a paper that I instantly recognised. None other than the chart on yellow paper with the three red crosses that I had found in the oilcloth at the bottom of the captain's chest. Why the doctor had given it to him was more than I could fancy. But if it were inexplicable to me, the appearance of the chart was incredible to the surviving mutineers. They leaped upon it like cats upon a mouse. It went from hand to hand, one tearing it from another. And by the oaths and the cries and the childish laughter with which they accompanied their examination, you would have thought, not only they were fingering the very gold, but were at sea with it, besides, in safety. Yes, said one, that's Flint's, sure enough, J.F., and a score below with a clovage to it, so he done ever. Mighty pretty, said George, but how are we to get away with it, and us, no ship? Silver, suddenly, sprang up, supporting himself with a hand against the wall. No, I give you warning, George, he cried. One more word of your sauce, and I'll call you down and fight you. How? Why? How do I know? You would ought to tell me that. You and the rest that lost me my schooner with your interference. Burn you! But not you, you can't. You ain't got the invention of a cockroach. But civil you can speak and shall, George Merry. You may lay to that. That's fair enough, said the old man, Morgan. Fair? I reckon so, said the sea cook. You lost the ship. I found the treasure. Who's the better man at that? And now I resign, by thunder. Elect whom you please to be your captain now. I'm done with it. Silver, they cried, barbecue forever, barbecue for Captain. So that's the tune, is it? cried the cook. George, I reckon you'll have to wait another turn, friend. And lucky for you, as I'm not a revengeful man. But that was never my way. And now, shipmates, this black spot, too much good now, is it? Dick crossed his luck and spoiled his Bible, and that's about all. It'll do to kiss the book on still, won't it? Growled Dick, who was, evidently, very uneasy at the curse he had brought upon himself. A Bible with a bit cut out? <sighs> Returned Silver derisively. Not it. Don't buy no more in a ballad book. Don't it, though? cried Dick, with a sort of joy. Well, I reckon that's worth having, too. Here, Jim, here's a curiosity for you, said Silver, and he tossed me the paper. It was around, about the size of a crown piece. One side was blank, for it had been the last leaf. The other contained a verse or two of revelation. These words, among the rest, which struck sharply home upon my mind. Without are dogs and murderers. The printed side had been blackened with wood ash, which already began to come off and soil my fingers. On the blank side had been written with the same material, the one word, deposed. I have that curiosity beside me at the moment, but not a trace of writing now remains beyond a single scratch, such as a man might make with his thumb thumbnail.
That was the end of the night's business. Soon after, with a drink all round, we lay down to sleep, and the outside of Silver's vengeance was to put George Merry up for sentinel, and threaten him with death if he should prove unfaithful. It was long ere I could close an eye, and heaven knows I had matter enough for thought in the man whom I had slain that afternoon, in my own most perilous position, and, above all, in the remarkable game that I saw Silver now engaged upon. Keeping the mutineers together with one hand, and grasping with the other, after every means, both possible and impossible, to make his peace and save his miserable life. He himself slept peacefully and snored aloud, yet my heart was sore for him, wicked as he was, to think on the dark perils that environed, and the shameful gibbet that awaited him. That's all for today, but what progress we have made. So much seems to have happened to poor young Jim in the last day, capturing a ship, becoming a captain, having to fight for his very life, and taking the life of another, returning to his home base only to find it captured by mutineers, and then to have those mutineers mutiny against their own captain, their own chosen leader. Quite a roller coaster for poor Jim, and I suppose for Long John Silver as well. I don't think he was quite looking forward to what happened that evening. But he seems to be sleeping soundly, and I suppose we will have to rest and wait to see the results of all of these happenings, and to learn what has become of the faithful crew of the Hispaniola. I'm sure they have their own story to tell, but we'll learn it next time on Soft Stories. Thank you all so much for joining me. This is where I leave you. But I'll see you soon.